welcome to Intro 101. My name is Chris, and I am your neuroscience and psychology graduate student assistant. I'm here to assist you with the related science basics that you interact with on a daily basis. My goal for doing this is to help you start or continue to build a foundation in human biology and physiology that can better help you engage with the information you consume from your favorite health and wellness educators and influencers. Much like the way a graduate assistant helps prepare intro students so they can better engage with lectures delivered by their professors. Or maybe you're here because you just like a better idea of what's going on under the lid. Either way, grab a notepad and pencil and beverage of choice and stick with me for the next forever minutes because today we embark on a fabulous adventure into the cellular level of the nervous system. Today's episode is Intro to Nervous System Cell Physiology 101, Part 1. It is entirely devoted to the beautiful, complex, and very chatty neuron. We'll go over basic cell structure, anatomy, and function, including neural communication and its role in the production and release of neurotransmitters. We'll look at a few different kinds of neurotransmitters and where they project in the central nervous system. And we'll also cover some of the different types of neurons and where in the body they live. You may be surprised. I'll introduce you to some inspiring neurobiologists and neuroscientists, both past and present, who have made incredible contributions to our understanding of this mighty cell. Before we start, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge with much gratitude that Intro 101 is recorded on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Kwantlen, Keitsi, Matsqui, and Semiamu First Nations. Additionally, we here at Intro 101 believe wholeheartedly that science is for everybody. In fact, the richness, complexity, and strength of scientific research is astronomically improved by the inclusion of many varied voices. To ensure everybody has access to education, research resources, and representation across scientific fields the world over, I will be sharing organizations in the show notes that provide access to STEM education opportunities and research resources and ask that you check them out and support them in any way that you can. Please donate share their work on your social media networks, or maybe volunteer your time to help them. If you already advocate or generate opportunities that provide equitable access to STEM education and resources within your own communities, or support other STEM organizations not listed here, do let us know about them in the comments below so others can contribute as they are able. All right, welcome to class. Let's crack on with Nervous System Cell Physiology 101, Part 1, The Neuro. I'm very excited about all the things I want to share with you today. I'm almost overwhelmed by choice as to where to begin. We really get into the details today. So this episode is a little bit like a choose your own adventure book. I recap some of the major discussion sections. So if you just want the light version of neuron physiology, you can choose to just watch or listen to the recaps. If you love reveling in the minutia, or just really want a deeper understanding of what these cells do, follow along the whole way through. Or mix it up, you have options. So we'll start with a recap of some of the general facts you learned from the previous episodes. If you remember, your nervous system is one of 11 body systems that work together to maintain homeostasis in your body. If you're new to this channel and new to the nervous system, please check out the previous episodes to get familiar with what homeostasis is and to get a broader understanding of the nervous system and its many parts. Okay, so also a reminder that the nervous system is one of two regulatory body systems, the endocrine system being the other. Nervous system tissue is made up of particular types of cells. The ones we hear about the most are the stars of today's episode, neurons. Neurons are special because they send and receive chemical and electrical messages signaling to the body and brain to take some kind of action. There are many different kinds of neurons throughout the nervous system, and they are highly specialized, meaning they carry out functions specific to their type. The adult human nervous system has somewhere around 86 billion neurons in the brain, 500,000 motor neurons in the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system, 10 million sensory neurons in the afferent division of the peripheral nervous system, and somewhere between 200 and 600 million neurons in the enteric nervous system, which if you remember from the nervous system episode, it's located in the wall of your gastrointestinal tract. Yes, you have millions of neurons outside of your brain. 
For a long time, it was believed that the brain contained 100 billion neurons. But neuroscientist Susanna Herculano Husell figured out a more accurate way to count them than had been previously attempted. In fact, she couldn't find where the original count of 100 billion neurons came from. So she devised an experiment by which she dissolved a human brain into what she calls brain soup. And from that, she was able to identify and count neuronal nuclei, and she and her colleagues counted 86 billion neurons in the brain on average. During the same process, she was able to count non-neuronal nuclei as well, which was roughly the same number as neurons, and that too is wildly less than what was originally hypothesized. We'll get to nervous system cells that aren't neurons in the next episode. We can't really begin to discuss neurons without first mentioning two men who share a Nobel Prize for their independent contributions to our understanding of neuronal morphology. They are Camillo Golgi and Santiago Ramon y Cajal. You'll recognize Camillo Golgi from the last episode on cell physiology as the discoverer of the Golgi complex, also called Golgi apparatus. Though even having an important organelle named after him slightly pales in comparison to perhaps his most beloved contribution to science, and that was the invention of a staining method that rendered the structure of individual neurons visible for the first time. Named, of course, the Golgi stain. Now, though Golgi made these really important discoveries, he also championed a theory about how neurons function that didn't pan out to be accurate. He believed that neurons fused together to form a kind of net of nerves that operated as one whole unit rather than each individual neuron operating on its own. This is where Ramoni Cajal enters the scene. He refuted Golgi's theory, ironically by using the Golgi stain method to study the nervous tissue of many organisms, including human, and he found that neurons are indeed their own contained units and communicate to each other, albeit at an extremely close range. More on that in a bit. But do take a minute to appreciate these two important historical figures. Both Golgi and Romoni Cajal included detailed drawings of neurons while documenting their findings. In fact, Romoni Cajal was an artist before he was a scientist. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be one of the first people to see a neuron, especially through the eyes of an artist. There is something about both Golgi and Ramoni Cajal's renderings that bears witness to whatever awe and wonder they may have experienced when they first laid eyes on these beauties. Their illustrations look simultaneously otherworldly and familiar, like something you might find growing in the shady underbelly of a forest. I almost wish I hadn't seen a modern graphic rendering of a neuron before I saw Golgi and Ramoni Cajal's illustrations. Some of their work is beautifully meticulous, and yet some also seem a bit rough and rushed, but in those, you can almost sense the magic and urgency of feverishly trying to capture a moment of discovery. I've posted a link in the show notes below that has a gallery devoted to the illustrations of both of these men. If you take a minute to look at their illustrations, try to imagine what it would be like to be them, seeing these tiny, fantastical-looking cells for the first time. So... What do these fantastical neurons look like? Well, as I've mentioned, their shape and size vary by type. The multipolar neuron is the most abundant and likely most represented in typical diagrams of a single neuron. Our graphic represents a multipolar neuron, which seems to be the most common type found in the central nervous system. It has a tree-like structure with what looks like branches extending from a cell body, a longer thin trunk projecting from the cell body, and roots protruding from the bottom of that trunk. The cell body is called the soma, and its intracellular physiology is very much like that described in the previous episode on typical cell physiology, with the addition of granules called nesal bodies, which is kind of like additional rough endoplasmic reticulum to aid in the abundance of proteins a soma needs to produce. Otherwise, it has a nucleus containing genetic material and organelles suspended in cytosol. Like most other cell bodies, the soma carries out basic cell functions, but on top of that, it carries out all sorts of business specific to nervous system function. This will get clearer as we get more acquainted with the neuron's main job, and that is cell-to-cell communication by a process called neurotransmission. 
But to give you an idea of the amount of activity going on, we can look at the kind of energy neurons consume in just a resting state. And for that, we turn to a study by Zhu and colleagues. They were able to calculate that a single cortical neuron, so a neuron in the cortex of the brain, like our example, so a single cortical neuron utilizes approximately 4.7 billion ATP molecules per second in a resting human brain. And by resting brain, they mean the brain activity of a human in a fully relaxed condition. Can you imagine what the metabolic output would be if you were being chased by a bear? It would be a lot. Okay, so what's going on in the cell body that requires so much energy? If you remember from the last episode, one of the jobs mitochondria are tasked with is making ATP, which is the fuel cells need to do their business. So in a kind of cellular version of an internal return, the cell needs to make a ton of ATP to not only provide enough fuel to burn 4.7 billion molecules of it per neuron per second, it also has to make enough fuel to keep making and metabolizing ATP. Consider the amount of mitochondria needed to produce that much ATP. So as you can imagine, there is an abundance of mitochondria in a typical neuron. The cell also produces and packages hundreds of different proteins, each with its own specific supportive function. It also manufactures different types of chemical molecules that it needs to transport to the very end of the neuron, and those determine the type of signal being sent to the next neuron. We'll get into how all of this plays out in a minute, but for now know that the soma is a hub of manufacturing activity that takes a ridiculous amount of energy to produce, organize, synthesize, and transport all the goods needed to do its business. Okay, now the tree-like appendages branching off of the soma are called dendrites. The word dendrite comes from the Greek word dendron, which means tree. Not all neurons have dendrites, but those that do have junctions at the ends that receive signals from other neurons. The dendrite branches also have many tiny thorn-like structures attached to them called spines. Dendritic spines, like the dendritic junctions, also receive signals from other neurons, expanding its own neuron's ability to receive multiple signals. It's been suggested that dendritic spines attract a specific type of signal called excitatory input. More on that later on. And additionally, spines also appear to rapidly change in shape and number during neuronal activity. This will be important to remember when we get to discussions on neuroplasticity in future episodes. Okay, moving on to another side of the soma, where there is a protruding thin trunk. This trunk is called the axon, also called a nerve fiber, that projects to other parts of the brain and body at varying lengths depending on where in the nervous system it is. It has a very important role in passing along, or transmitting, a signal to the next neuron. So the dendrites are signal receivers, and the axon is a signal transmitter. The outer surface of some axons is covered in a fatty substance called myelin, and that has a specific purpose related to insulating the signal that is traveling along the axon. More on that in a minute. The axon's intracellular physiology is incredibly dynamic and involved in transporting molecular cargo from and to the soma, because the end of the axon, which is the end of the neuron, can be quite a distance from the cell body or soma, there needs to be a way to get things that are produced in the soma to the other end of the neuron. This is accomplished by a process called axoplasmic transport. And the best way I can explain what this is, is to ask you to imagine a tiny headless protein with legs, feet, and arms, carrying a giant sack full of goods along a microtubule to the end of the axon. They do this at a speed of roughly 500 millimeters per day. If you're unsure of what a microtubule is, it's a long, thin tubular track with loads of functions, but see the previous episode on cell physiology for a more in-depth description. So, tiny headless proteins transport cargo to the end of the axon, but that's not all. Sometimes bits need to travel from the end of the axon back to the soma, and this process is called retrograde axoplasmic transport. But same basic principle, little headless dude walking cargo along a microtubule, only retrograde transport takes place at a much slower pace. I kid you not, this is happening inside your body right now. 
So what's at the end of the axon that has so much business going on it needs to receive and send cargo? The end of an axon can branch off into root-like structures, and at the ends of those roots are bulbs called terminal buttons, or I've also heard them called synaptic buttons. Inside the terminal buttons are where chemicals called neurotransmitters are synthesized, stored, and released into the extracellular space between the terminal button and the dendrite of another neuron it's trying to communicate with. Neurotransmitters are also called chemical messengers because they are chemical molecules. This chemical transmission is how the signal is passed on to the next neuron. This process is called neurotransmission, and this whole space is called the synapse. So the synapse includes the presynaptic terminal button, the postsynaptic dendrite, and the space in between them, which is called the synaptic cleft. So you might be wondering what material needs to be transported up and down the axon between the soma and the terminal button. Well, the terminal button contains large and small vesicles called synaptic vesicles, which are like round membranous sacs that look like escape pods. The small synaptic vesicles contain neurotransmitters. The large synaptic vesicles contain different types of peptides. The soma produces these large and small vesicle sacs and the peptides and it makes the enzymes needed to synthesize neurotransmitters. And the tiny protein dudes are transporting all of this from the soma to the terminal button by axoplasmic transport. Important to note is that every part of the neuron is contained inside a plasma membrane. So even though it's a strange shape, the plasma membrane surrounds the whole thing. So dendrites, axons, and terminal buttons too, not just the soma. The plasma membrane is incredibly important in cell communication, but more on that in a moment. Okay, so quick recap. The typical neuron looks a bit like a tree with dendrites branching off the soma. The dendrites have spines attached to them, and that enhances the cell's ability to pick up signals from neighboring neurons. The soma is the cell body, and it is a hive of manufacturing activity related to basic cell function and neurotransmission. Protruding from the soma is a long, thin, trunk-like structure called the axon. The axon is a nerve fiber of varying lengths and projects to both the brain and body depending on the type of neuron. The outside of the neuron transmits the electrical communication signal and some axons are covered in fatty myelin that helps insulate and speed up the signal. Inside the axon, a wondrous process called axoplasmic transport is taking place. And that is when tiny proteins carry cargo along microtubules that run the length of the axon from the soma to the axon's terminal buttons. Some of that cargo is small and large synaptic vesicles. Small synaptic vesicles contain neurotransmitters and large synaptic vesicles contain peptides most of which is manufactured in the soma. When they reach the terminal buttons of the synapse, also called presynaptic button, the synaptic vesicles are stored and await the electrical signal that is their cue to release their contents into the synaptic cleft, where they will find their way to the postsynaptic dendrite, and the process begins again at the next neuron. And all of this is contained within the borders of a plasma membrane. Next, we're going to look at the physiology of neurotransmission. I think the best way to get better acquainted with the physiology and function of a multipolar neuron is to follow a signal from the receiving end, so the receiving postsynaptic dendrites, all the way to the releasing end of the presynaptic buttons into the synaptic cleft, where the signal is then passed on chemically to the next postsynaptic dendrites. Before we get into the minutia of neurotransmission, it's probably a good idea to give you some general context as to the purpose of neurotransmission. I've said this in other episodes and I'll say it again here. It's easy to lose sight of the body's homeostatic goals when we talk about one tiny part in a siloed manner. I'm about to give you an example of cell communication in one neuron, but in reality, billions of neurons can be communicating at any one time and in a beautifully orchestrated symphony of chemical and electrical currents that initiate thoughts and actions and beget behavior and memories and emotions and movement and so much more. There are roughly 100 quadrillion synaptic connections and any one neuron can be connected to and communicating with 5,000 to 10,000 other neurons. 
this process, neurotransmission, is, as I've said, a regulatory process your body relies on to keep it in balance, to keep it in homeostasis. So try to hold that bigger picture in mind as we get into the details. So let's begin with our typical neuron communicating to another neuron. The typical communication modality of a multipolar neuron is synaptic transmission. So we're at the synapse. Now, Normally when we hear about neural communication, the phrasing can go something like, neurons send electrical pulses or signals throughout the brain and body to somewhere. For the most part, the signal is electric. It has an electrical charge, but the space between the presynaptic button and the postsynaptic dendrite called the synaptic cleft is too large a space, even though it's incredibly tiny, for an electrical current to directly leap across. So the presynaptic side of the synapse changes the electrical signal to a chemical signal. And it does this by releasing neurotransmitters. More on that when we get to the other side of the neuron. So the presynaptic button has just released a load of chemical neurotransmitter molecules into the fluid filled extracellular space that is the synaptic cleft. They diffuse across the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic or receiving dendrite. This is where it all kicks off. Dendrites can be smooth or they can have spines. Both are bordered by the cell's plasma membrane, but this particular area of the plasma membrane where the postsynaptic dendrite receives the neurotransmitter, this area is called postsynaptic membrane. This postsynaptic membrane contains special proteins called receptor channels. They're also called ionotropic receptors or ligand-gated receptors, but receptor channels is easier to say and also remember, so for now I'm going to refer to them as receptor channels. What makes them special is that they are protein units that contain an ion channel but also have receptors attached to them that unless activated, keep the ion channels closed or gated. This receptor part of the unit has a special binding site that is designed specifically for its partner neurotransmitter molecule. When the neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft, it will bind with the receptor like a key to a lock. No other type of neurotransmitter can bind to that receptor. When the neurotransmitter molecules bind to each available receptor, those receptors activate and open the ion channel it is attached to. In other words, these receptor channels are chemically gated ion channels, which means the signal the dendrite is receiving is in its chemical form and can only be in chemical form. There may be lots of reasons for this, but I think it helps keep the signal going in one direction. Because once it's past this point, it converts to an electrical form and that electrical form can't manipulate these gates. A quick reminder from the previous episode on cell physiology is that ion channels are proteins in the plasma membrane that allow ions to cross the membrane's phospholipid bilayer because ions are water soluble and cannot pass through the lipid membrane on their own. Okay, so the neurotransmitter chemical molecule has bound to the receptor channel, opening up the ion channel. Here's where it gets very persnickety. How the signal converts from chemical back to electrical form depends on a few things. In general, what happens when the ion channel opens is that it allows ions to enter the intracellular space that will shift the electrical charge within the cell, either positively or negatively. If it shifts the charge positively and to a specific voltage threshold, then we've got ourselves a signal that will make it to the end of the neuron. If it doesn't quite reach that threshold, or if the charge is shifted negatively, making it even less likely it will reach the threshold, then this is where the signal ends. There is so much happening at this juncture that involves an intense amount of scientific understanding. I don't want to bury you in detail, but I'll get into it as best as I can, because we've looked at body physiology down to the cellular and molecular level so far in this series, but this next bit will take us to atomic levels. I told you in the first episode that our bodies recruit even the tiniest atoms to help us maintain homeostasis. And this is one very good example at how it achieves that. 
So to set up the next level of detail, it's important to understand that plasma membranes are electrically polarized, which means positively and negatively charged ions, ions are electrically charged atoms, they live on either side of the membrane in the intracellular and extracellular fluid. The intracellular side of the membrane is slightly more negatively charged than the extracellular side when the cell is at rest. This means it has slightly more negative ions on the inside of the cell than the extracellular side. When this dynamic changes, the polarization of the membrane changes, and that is called membrane potential. If an influx of positively charged ions cross the membrane into the intracellular space, the membrane depolarizes. If more negative ions enter the intracellular space or positive ions leave, it becomes even more negatively charged and the membrane hyperpolarizes. Okay, now park that for a minute. Another important thing to know is that when a neuron is not active, it is at rest. When it is at rest, the electrical charge of the membrane is polarized at roughly minus 70 millivolts. This is called resting potential. This is the set point which determines whether the membrane depolarizes or hyperpolarizes. If you remember, a set point is part of the homeostatic feedback loop. When it shifts too far from its range, the body initiates activity that will bring it back to its set point range. So when more positive ions enter the cell, it becomes less polarized than minus 70 millivolts. The charge moves closer to zero millivolts. For instance, a signal of small magnitude may shift the charge up to minus 60 millivolts. When it's hyperpolarized, the charge moves even farther from zero millivolts than minus 70 millivolts, so maybe it'll reach minus 80 millivolts. You can park this for a few minutes too. So let's rewind back to the postsynaptic dendrite where neurotransmitter molecules have unlocked the ion channels and let's approach how the signal converts from chemical back to electrical form with a little more detail. Now the how is going to depend on a few things. One is the type of neurotransmitter, and another is the ion channel it opens and the particular ions that channel allows into the cell. As for types of neurotransmitters, there are excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters. Excitatory neurotransmitters open ion channels that allow the passage of sodium ions across the membrane into the postsynaptic neuron. Sodium is a positively charged ion, so what's going to happen to the intracellular side of the membrane when loads of positive ions enter? It depolarizes, because now there are more positive ions inside the cell. When it becomes depolarized, it is more likely to create a potential. A potential is stored energy, and if an abundance of positively charged ions enter the intracellular space, it can change the voltage of the cell from resting potential to an action potential, a little bit further down the neuron. And the action potential is what keeps the signal moving. An excitatory potential at an excitatory synapse is known as an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP. Inhibitory neurotransmitters open ion channels that either allow more positive ions to leave the membrane or more negative ions to enter the cell, increasing the negative charge inside. This is called hyperpolarization and it pretty much kills any chance that there will be enough potential to keep the signal moving. The inhibitory neurotransmitter inhibits further activity and this is aptly called inhibitory postsynaptic potential or IPSP. There are many instances when this is a good thing. Please don't think that because a signal terminates that something is wrong. We don't want to be firing all the time. For example, what prevents alertness from becoming hypervigilance and anxiousness are inhibitory neurotransmitters. The most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter is glutamate. Glutamate almost always produces excitatory potentials or EPSPs. The main inhibitory neurotransmitter is gamma amino, aminobutyric acid. Gamma, gamma aminobutyric acid. Gamma aminobutyric acid, also known as GABA. It's GABA. Just, it's GABA.
GABA always produces inhibitory potentials, or IPSPs. We'll look at these and other neurotransmitters in a few minutes. An excitatory potential at one synapse may not depolarize a postsynaptic dendrite membrane enough to create an action potential that moves the signal along. But all of a neuron's dendrites and dendritic spines together receive a ton of inputs at the same time, and the summation of simultaneous excitatory and inhibitory inputs results in a total postsynaptic potential. Since excitatory potentials are more likely to create enough potential to move the signal along, we'll assume that our neuron example received a total postsynaptic potential that is excitatory and at a large enough magnitude that we can follow it along the neuron. So once excitatory potential is established at the postsynaptic area of the membrane, the resulting ion difference inside and outside of the membrane creates a current of ion movement along the resting membrane, changing the membrane potential as it flows. This is called a graded potential, and it can sort of lose its oomph as it travels along the membrane away from its trigger point at the postsynaptic dendrite. But if the magnitude of the excitatory potential is large enough, so a high enough voltage, it can create a graded potential that can depolarize the membrane all the way through the soma to a pivotal area at the beginning of the axon called the axon hillock. The axon hillock has loads of sodium ion channels. Only these ion channels are activated by changes in electrical membrane potential. And this dense patch of sodium ion channels makes the axon hillock extremely sensitive to changes in membrane potential. If the graded potential, so this flow of electrical current depolarizing the membrane as it travels from dendrite through the soma, if it reaches the axon hillock on the other side of the soma, it still has a magnitude of voltage that meets the axon hillock's threshold, which is about minus 55 millivolts. This dense little patch of sodium ion channels open and an explosive influx of sodium ions flood the intracellular space and supercharge the current, creating the all-important action potential. Once the action potential is triggered, no other event is required to blast that supercharged current down the axon to the terminal buttons and launch neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. When you hear terminology like neurons fire or spike, that is referring to the moment the action potential is triggered. An important note about the action potential threshold is that the graded potential must hit that threshold of minus 55 millivolts. It's called the all or nothing phenomenon. If it's even a little less, the action potential will not be triggered and the neuron will not fire. But if it hits minus 55 millivolts, the sodium ion channels fly open and the influx of sodium changes the voltage to somewhere near plus 30 millivolts. That's a difference of 85 millivolts from threshold, and that's 100 millivolt difference from resting potential. If you need a visual to lock in this all or none phenomena, think of Marty McFly in a DeLorean with a flux capacitor. If he can get the DeLorean to a threshold of 88 miles per hour, there's an electrical explosion and he rockets into another time. It can't be less than 88 miles per hour. That is the threshold. With the graded potential traveling along your neurons, it has to meet minus 55 millivolts, and it has to be at least that voltage at the axon hillock for the action potential to rocket down the axon. It won't rocket us into another time, but you'll move a muscle or blink. Actually, I mean, I guess, the, I guess technically a reflex arc happens faster than the event it's responding to can register in our conscious awareness. So maybe some of our neurons do fire into the future if present time exists only at the moment we perceive it. I don't know. What do you think? Leave a comment below. It's just for fun, so please be kind. I kind of like the idea that part of us can live in the future. Like baby time lords. Okay, moving on. So what's happening along the axon while this supercharged current is rocketing to its end? Well, once the action potential is triggered at the axon hillock, the current is propelled down the axon by way of one of two methods, contiguous 
or saltatory conduction. Contiguous conduction involves axons that are not myelinated. So these are axons that are not insulated with fatty cells, and this conduction follows a very similar pattern to the flow of current we find in the graded potential mentioned earlier. It requires the same action of an influx of sodium ions moving into the intracellular space of the axon through voltage-gated sodium ion channels, shifting the charge to a significantly more positive charge and thereby depolarizing the membrane one patch of membrane at a time all the way down the axon. What makes the contiguous conduction of an action potential different from a graded potential triggered at the excitatory synapse is that it doesn't lose any oomph. It maintains its momentum, and it does this because what's traveling down the axon isn't actually the same action potential as the initial trigger at the axon hillock. New action potentials are being triggered at sequential sections of membrane all the way down the axon. Contiguous means in sequence, and that's what's happening. Action potentials are igniting new identical action potentials in sequential patches of plasma membrane along the axon by way of an influx of sodium ions through voltage-gated ion channels at each patch. This depolarizes the membrane to a voltage threshold that launches another action potential in the next section, and so on and so on from beginning to the end of the axon. What keeps the action potential going in one direction? Well, once the next section of membrane becomes activated, the previous section returns to its resting state. And when it returns to its resting state, it enters something called a refractory period. This means that when the next action potential is generated and depolarization of the membrane happens, the voltage-gated sodium ion channels in the previously active section of the membrane remain closed so they cannot be triggered to open again until the whole cell returns to resting state and resets them. So both contiguous and saltatory conduction can only happen in one direction. Now, saltatory conduction involves myelinated axons. If you remember from earlier, our example of a multipolar neuron is covered in a fatty substance called myelin, and it acts as an insulator. If you recall, ions are water soluble and can't cross through lipid layers without assistance. So ions cannot pass into or out of myelin as there are no ion channels in myelin. In the peripheral nervous system, these myelin cells are called Schwann cells. In the central nervous system, they're called oligodendrocytes. Since our sample neuron is in the central nervous system, we'll continue the journey of the action potential as though the myelin is oligodendrocytes. To be clear, myelin is not part of the neuron. It's like sheets of lipid membrane that are wrapped around the axon like a Swiss roll, but more like a Swiss roll zilla, because it can have up to 300 lipid sheet layers, and it does this in sections all along the axon. Schwann cells are individual Swiss roll-like cells independent of each other lined up along the axon. Oligodendrocytes are cells with many arms that have Swiss roll-like hands at the end of them called myelin sheath. And the arms sort of reach out and wrap the myelin Swiss roll hands around the axons. One oligodendrocyte can reach out and wrap around many parts of one axon and also to multiple other axons in the vicinity. These myelin Swiss roll hands are not butted up right next to each other. There's a little space in between each of them and those spaces are called nodes of Ranvier. And those spaces or nodes are bare naked axon completely exposed to the extracellular fluid. These exposed bits of axon are important because that is where each action potential is initiated down the myelinated axon. These nodes are packed with sodium ion channels that get activated as the current flows down the axon. I say flow, but it more like jumps over myelin to the next node. The word saltatory comes from the Latin word saltus, which means to jump. So saltatory conduction is an electrical charge jumping from one node to the next. And this significantly increases the speed of the electrical pulse to about 50 times faster than contiguous conduction. This is important for neural pathways that need to respond quickly to input. Like consider your visual pathways. There is a bundle of axons that runs from the neurons in your retina to the back of your brain, and it's called the optic nerve, and it contains roughly 1 million myelinated axons because that info has to zip-zip at lightning speeds 
to where image processors live, so you can make sense of those inputs by turning them into forms you can recognize. If those were unmyelinated axons, theoretically our visual processing speeds would probably lag quite a bit, because it would take much longer for input to reach the visual processing brain areas. In reality, demyelinated axons that are supposed to be myelinated are implicated in a number of neurodegenerative diseases. In the optic nerve, deterioration of myelin may play a role in the development of glaucoma. So myelin is very important, and we'll talk more about the cells that form it, so oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells, in more detail in the next episode. So just now I gave you an example of myelinated axons and why they need to be myelinated. But what about neurons with unmyelinated axons? Well, unmyelinated neurons are present in both the peripheral and central nervous systems. And an example of neurons that are unmyelinated are those involved in your body's ability to sense pain brought on by damage to body tissue, like a burn to the skin. So I'm not sure why those neurons need to be unmyelinated. You'd think you'd want faster processing speeds if your skin is on fire. But I guess there are other neurons receiving input that are myelinated and are already trying to put out the flames before you're experiencing the full magnitude of pain. So I'm wondering if maybe the unmyelinated neurons help slow or temper the magnitude of pain experienced. I don't know for certain that unmyelinated neurons involved in pain processing are directly involved in tempering immediate pain processing, but it makes sense to me that they would slightly delay the amount of pain processed, perhaps to aid in pain tolerance. Something to look into for another time. Okay, now there's another aspect to action potentials that provides another layer of context to homeostasis of the cell. If you remember from a few minutes ago, I said the resting membrane potential of the neuron is about minus 70 millivolts. But when we get an excitatory potential at a magnitude that depolarizes the cell to a threshold of minus 55 millivolts at the axon hillock, that creates that action potential that zips down the axon. So how does the cell close the loop and get back to a resting state? Well, While the action potential is happening, there are a couple of things that kick in just after the sodium ion channels fly open in response to depolarization. The ion channels are voltage gated, and oddly what makes them open also makes them close again, only slower than the speed of opening. So the sodium ion channel gates fly open and loads of sodium flies into the intracellular space but their ion channels start to close half a millisecond later, preventing any more sodium ions from entering the cell. And the channels will stay closed until another action potential is initiated. The second thing that happens involves other ions that are at work. One of the other ions I want to draw your attention to is potassium. Potassium ions are positively charged ions that at resting state dominate the intracellular space as far as positive ions go not enough to create depolarization because there are still more negative ions than positive ions in the intracellular space. Potassium ions are also kind of like wandering free ions. In the plasma membrane, they have both gated ion channels that are closed until activated, as well as a few special ion channels that are open all the time so they can leak into extracellular space or not. They're on their own journey. They're peace-loving, rest-promoting ions until an action potential rips through the neuron blasting positively charged sodium ions into their space. With ions, opposites attract and same Z's repel. So positive potassium ions aren't super keen to stick around in spaces that get supercharged with an abundance of positive sodium ions because they have the same electrical charge. When the membrane is at peak potential after it's reached threshold, gated potassium ion channels slowly open and potassium exits the cell to go, I don't know, plant some peace in the extracellular space. And when they do that, it shifts the amount of positive charge in the intracellular space. And when that happens, the membrane potential drops from peak to resting. Technically, the membrane potential would eventually reach a resting state by the sodium ion channels closing and potassium ions gradually leaking through its open channels into the extracellular space. But potassium having its own gated ion channels speeds up the process in a kind of reverse graded potential on the extracellular side of the membrane. This rushing of potassium ions into the extracellular space is called potassium efflux. Because both potassium leaky channels and gated channels are open, 
the efflux of potassium is slightly more excessive than necessary, in effect, hyperpolarizing the membrane. So dipping below resting potential before it normalizes again to resting potential. So now we have a bunch of potassium ions in the extracellular space and a bunch of sodium ions in the intracellular space. So how does the cell go back to its resting state concentrations of sodium and potassium on either side of the cell membrane? Well, the membrane has yet another protein embedded in its phospholipid bilayer. It's not an ion channel. It's not a receptor. It's a pump, specifically a sodium-potassium pump. For every three sodium ions it pumps back out of the cell, it pumps two potassium ions back into the cell. It's relatively slow, but eventually it will restore the ion concentrations on either side of the membrane. The neuron doesn't have to wait for the pump to completely restore these concentrations before it can launch another action potential because there are still loads of other sodium and potassium ions on their respective sides of the membrane. But it does need to keep pumping to keep the concentrations at odds. So more potassium inside than outside and more sodium outside than inside. Okay, so, so far we've followed the signal from receiving dendritic synapses all along the membrane to the axon hillock to transmitting down the axon, and now we are almost full circle at the synapse. But before we get there, what happens at the end of the axon at the terminal buttons? Remember back to the dendrites, where they received the signal in chemical form and converted it to electrical form. So how does the electrical form of the action potential convert back to chemical form before it's released into the synapse by presynaptic neuron? Well, when the action potential reaches the terminal end of the axon, more ion channels spring open. Only this time, they're calcium channels in the terminal buttons. We'll call them the presynaptic buttons for clarity. The presynaptic buttons contain synaptic vesicles. Remember the tiny protein dude carrying vesicle sacs full of stuff produced in the soma and transporting them down microtubules to the presynaptic buttons in a process called axoplasmic transport? Those are the synaptic vesicles contained in the presynaptic button. So the voltage-gated calcium ion channels in the buttons open and an influx of calcium ions enter the synaptic button. And when that happens, it triggers an event called exocytosis. That's when some of the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane so it becomes part of the membrane and all of its contents spill out into the synaptic cleft. Those contents are neurotransmitters and they diffuse across the synaptic cleft and we start this process all over again at the postsynaptic dendrite. Some terminal buttons synapse with dendrites and some synapse to the soma membrane. In our example, the presynaptic button synapses with postsynaptic dendrites. Now, I've just described a chemical synapse, but there are also electrical synapses, not many, but they are involved where synchronized neural firing is necessary. For instance, they are most abundant in a part of the brain that secretes a neurohormone responsible for controlling the reproductive system, but it must do so in a distinct synchronized pattern of secretion because the cells on the receiving end only respond to this pattern. <sighs> okay, we've made it all the way through the process of one neuron receiving excitatory input and firing an action potential to its terminal end where it passed it on to the next neuron. This was a lot of detailed information, so thank you for sticking with me. But let's recap quickly before we look at some of the different kinds of neurotransmitters and what happens to them after they've done their business in the synaptic cleft. So to recap neurotransmission, postsynaptic dendrites receive an incoming chemical neurotransmitter that is either excitatory or inhibitory, and it connects like a key to a lock to receptor channels in the plasma membrane. If it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, it unlocks sodium ion channels, allowing an influx of positive sodium ions into the intracellular space, which depolarizes the membrane and converts the chemical signal to electrical. If it's inhibitory, positive potassium ions leave the cell or negatively charged chloride ions enter the cell and hyperpolarizes the membrane and terminates the signal. Because the dendrites receive multiple inputs, the summation of inputs determines if the total membrane potential is excitatory or inhibitory. And if it produces an excitatory synaptic potential with a high enough magnitude, it begets a graded membrane potential that should be strong enough 
to reach the axon hillock at threshold, which is minus 55 millivolts. This then triggers loads of sodium ion channels to fly open and allow an influx of sodium ions into the intracellular space, rapidly depolarizing the membrane and launching it down the axon either by unmyelinated contiguous conduction or myelinated saltatory conduction. Both require creating new action potentials along the axon at either sections of the membrane or at nodes of exposed axon called nodes of Ranvier. But once the action potential is triggered, it does not lose momentum. It will fire the length of the axon to the terminal buttons where it triggers calcium gated ion channels to open and cause an influx of calcium ions. This triggers vesicles to release neurotransmitter chemicals into the synaptic cleft and diffuse across the cleft to the receiving postsynaptic dendrites, which converts it back to an electrical signal, and so on and so on until whatever action needed to happen, happens. The neuron returns to a resting state by way of potassium ions leaving the intracellular space after sodium ions invade their space, which repolarizes the membrane to a resting potential. And eventually, a sodium-potassium pump helps both types of ions find their way back home to their favorite side of the membrane. Okay, lilies, have a stretch, hydrate, because now we're going to look a little closer at neurotransmitters and what their roles are beyond propagating a signal to the next neuron. But first, we're gonna look at what happens to them after they've done their business in the synaptic cleft. This part may seem like excessive detail, but this very tiny gap, the synaptic cleft between neurons, is a most beloved space. It's in this space where many therapeutic drugs and recreational drugs slash drugs of abuse intentionally manipulate your brain chemistry, sometimes for beneficial outcomes, other times, not so much. You may wish to know how and why this happens. So after the presynaptic button has released these neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft and it is bound to the receptor channels in the postsynaptic membrane, in order for another neurotransmission to happen, the previous neurotransmission needs to be inactivated by removing the neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft. This happens a few different ways. One is reuptake, another is degradation by enzymes, and lastly, it can just wander away from the synapse by way of diffusion. Reuptake is the fastest and most efficient way, and simply put, the neurotransmitter is taken back up into the presynaptic or terminal button to be recycled and restored in vesicles or demolished by enzymes. You may be wondering how it does this because the vesicle that housed this neurotransmitter fused with the presynaptic button membrane, so it's not going back into those vesicles. Well, much like ion channels embedded in the postsynaptic plasma membrane allow ions into and out of the cell, the presynaptic button has transporter molecules embedded in the plasma membrane that draws the neurotransmitter back into the intracellular space of the terminal button and they are recycled and repackaged into vesicles. You may recognize the word reuptake because a certain type of antidepressant called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, have received a lot of attention lately. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, and we'll visit it in more detail in a minute, but SSRIs are a therapeutic drug that targets the serotonin reuptake transporter. So though normally reuptake is very fast, like immediately after releasing a neurotransmitter, an SSRI will slow the reuptake of serotonin by blocking the transporter, and this inhibits the transporter's ability to draw serotonin out of the synaptic cleft and back into the presynaptic button. The idea is that the longer serotonin can linger in the synaptic cleft, the more often it can stimulate the postsynaptic neuron. Though to be clear, we're still not super sure why SSRIs work. And indeed, in 60 to 70% of people with moderate to severe depression who try SSRIs, it will effectively help regulate their mood. Regardless, hopefully you're getting a clearer idea of what's happening at the synaptic cleft after the neurotransmitter has been released. The second way neurotransmitters are cleaned up from the synaptic cleft is enzymatic degradation, and that is when enzyme activity breaks down the neurotransmitter into its component parts that can either be recycled or diffused away from the synaptic cleft. 
the enzyme responsible for degradation is going to be particular to the neurotransmitter. An example of this process occurs when the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released. It is cleaned up by both enzymatic degradation and transporter molecules. The enzyme acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine into choline and acetate molecules. The choline is drawn back into the presynaptic button by the transporter molecule and recycled to make new acetylcholine. I'm not 100% sure what happens to the acetate. I think it either diffuses away or make it gobbled up by other non-neuronal cells. And then the third mechanism of synaptic cleft cleanup is diffusion. Diffusion is when the neurotransmitter floats away from the cleft into the great extracellular space, like a bunch of George Clooney's in the film Gravity, except without the untethering drama. It appears this happens at just about every synaptic junction. There will be some diffusion of the neurotransmitters, even if the primary mechanism is reuptake or enzymatic degradation. So let's look at some of the different neurotransmitters and what they can do and how they're cleaned up from the synaptic cleft. As mentioned, the two primary neurotransmitters responsible for excitation and inhibition of signals are glutamate and GABA. Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, so brain and spinal cord. And its main gig is to help move signals along from cell to cell until whatever action needs to happen, happens. If enough glutamate is released to the postsynaptic neuron at the many dendritic ends and spines, if we use our example of the neuron, the abundance of excitation ensures the summation of inputs will total an excitatory synaptic potential, which, as we know already, increases the likelihood of propagating the signal onto the next neuron. Glutamate is also active in learning and memory processes. It may also be involved in the sleep-wake cycle, I think that's been established in mouse models, but I'm not sure about humans. Glutamate can also be used as fuel when ATP is low. An interesting study by Fent and colleagues intentionally inhibited the glucose synthesis in neuronal mitochondria and found that the mitochondria instantly switched to oxidizing glutamate to produce fuel. This is helpful because too much glutamate can overstimulate postsynaptic responses, and that could lead to increased toxicity called excitotoxicity. This results in cell death that could lead to neurodegenerative conditions like ALS, as well as strokes. If neurons were redirected to consume excessive glutamate as a source of fuel, that may mitigate excitotoxicity levels. Not to worry, though, glutamate is usually removed from the synaptic cleft by way of reuptake through transporters in the presynaptic membrane. Of special interest in the health and wellness spheres are glutamate receptor channels. So remember, those are the receptor plus ion channel units in the postsynaptic membrane that allow ions to enter the cell. In this case, positively charged sodium ions that generate excitatory postsynaptic potentials when glutamate binds to that receptor part. Glutamate has four major types of receptors, and one of these glutamate receptors is called the NMDA receptor. And this receptor is special for many reasons. It plays an important role in learning and memory, so you may have heard of it in that context. You may have also heard it mentioned during discussions of alcohol consumption and withdrawal. Alcohol affects the transmission of glutamate by messing with the gate of this particular NMDA receptor. It's not able to stay open as long as it should, which would lessen the excitatory effect of this neurotransmitter and lower the firing rate of these neurons. Given the processes glutamate is involved with, tampering with its ability to do its job interferes with memory, learning, cognition, and even some motor function. So when you hear or read someone say that alcohol is an NMDA receptor antagonist, What they're really saying is that alcohol inhibits the function of that particular glutamate receptor. Alcohol affects other cellular functions, but I wanted to mention the NMDA receptor because it can be difficult to understand why this mechanism matters without some context. Okay, so moving on to GABA. It's the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter found in the brain and spinal cord. We didn't get into great detail on what happens at the postsynaptic membrane when an inhibitory neurotransmitter like GABA binds to its receptor channel 
other than to briefly mention that depending on the channel, it either lets potassium ions out or allows chloride ions into the intracellular space to make it more negatively charged. But again, the summation of the signal charge is what matters, and if the total postsynaptic potential is inhibitory, it won't propagate the signal any further. And this is a good thing in many instances. There's a reason GABA is the primary and most abundant and widely distributed inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. Well, many reasons. But first and foremost, it stabilizes brain activity. If neurons kept firing all over the place, it would be chaos. In fact, some researchers believe that disordered GABA production, release, and receptor binding underlies the onset of seizures, and GABA's regulatory function helps attenuate overactivity that would otherwise lead to anxiety, agitation that disrupts concentration, sleep disturbances, and even depression. GABA is removed from the synaptic cleft by reuptake transporters. Of note in health and wellness discussions, GABA also has several types of receptors at the postsynaptic membrane, but a particularly important one, cleverly named GABA-A, is quite the target for numerous anxiolytic drugs, which are anti-anxiety drugs. One class you may recognize is benzodiazepines. They bind to this receptor to reduce anxiety and induce muscle relaxation. They've also been used to reduce seizure activity and to remit catatonia. They do this by unlocking GABA-A receptors to regulate any deficiencies in GABAergic function. A cautionary note about benzodiazepines, prolonged use places the user at very high risk for developing dependency, or worse, an addiction to them. I say prolonged, but dependency can kick in if taken longer than two weeks. Dosage and duration must be monitored by a medical professional, as does discontinuing use. It's not a drug you just stop taking. The dosage needs to be tapered because full-blown benzo withdrawal will make you wish you could crawl out of your own skin, and that's partly due to its persistent interaction with GABA-A receptors. Okay, so I'll introduce a few more neurotransmitters, and some of them have roles in both the peripheral and central nervous systems. How they are organized in the central nervous system, so brain and spinal cord, can be quite complex. So I think the best way to give you context for now is to describe them as having their own specific pathways. And what I mean by pathways is the trajectory a neural signal takes until it reaches its final destination. This trajectory can be neurons forming synaptic connections to other neurons to propagate a signal along as many neurons as it takes until it synapses to neurons that kick out different neurotransmitters. It could also be just one set of axons projecting to a whole other area of the brain. I've heard the words pathways and projections used interchangeably, so you may hear that too. I believe it's referring to the same idea, though perhaps projection is referring more specifically to the axons and the directions they are projecting. Either way, it's referring to the route the neurons want the signal to travel in order to involve brain areas needed to excite an action or inhibit an action. But in the context of neurotransmitters, their pathways begin where there is a cluster or an abundance of neurons that produce a particular neurotransmitter and those neurons project to other areas of the brain and spinal cord. In the central nervous system, glutamate and GABA are widely distributed throughout the brain and spinal cord. You'll find them just about everywhere. They are also involved in specific pathways, but these next examples of neurotransmitters are not widely distributed in the central nervous system and mainly have specific routes they take to excite or inhibit an action. So first up is an excitatory neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. It's found both in central and peripheral nervous systems. It has a major role in the peripheral nervous system. All of the neurons that excite your skeletal muscles to make voluntary movements, like my hands, do so by releasing acetylcholine. All of your skeletal muscles have cholinergic receptors. Go ahead and wiggle your fingers just Now, that required acetylcholine transmission to do just that. In the central nervous system, acetylcholine has specific pathways, and three that I'll mention are named according to the locations in the brain where there are an abundance of acetylcholine-releasing neurons. 
We'll do a whole episode on the brain very soon, so not to worry if you don't recognize any of these labeled brain areas just yet. The first pathway begins in the dorsolateral pons, and it is involved in REM sleep. The pons is in the brainstem, and dorsal means back, think dorsal fin, and lateral is side, or furthest from the midline of the brain. So at the sides of the pons and towards the back are a bunch of acetylcholinergic neurons, or also called cholinergic neurons. And there are a few hypotheses as to where they project to initiate the onset of REM sleep, mostly neighboring neurons or possibly as far away as the periaqueductal gray, which is just above the pons in the midbrain. Another cholinergic pathway begins in the basal forebrain, Basal means base, so at the base of the forebrain, there is a constellation of cholinergic neurons, and they project the cerebral cortex to promote perceptual learning. The last cholinergic pathway I'll mention also begins in the basal forebrain, but it projects to the hippocampus and contributes to the formation of memories. Acetylcholine has loads of other functions, including regulating blood pressure and heart rate, sexual desire, motivation, and many other things. I already used it as an example for how it's cleared from the synaptic cleft, but again, it's broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase into choline and acetate, and the choline is taken back into the presynaptic button by reuptake transporters, and the acetate, George Clooney's it off into extracellular space. Probably. Okay, the next neurotransmitter we'll discuss is serotonin. Serotonin is an inhibitory transmitter. Interestingly, even though most conversations about serotonin involve the brain, behavior, and mood, most serotonin is produced outside of the central nervous system. Outside of mood and behavior, serotonin helps regulate vascular, cardiac, respiratory, metabolic, gastrointestinal, sexual, urinary, and reproductive function. It is busy in our bodies. But even though so much of our serotonin is found outside of the central nervous system, Serotonin neurons within it play an enormous role in modulating almost all human behavior and many neuropsychological processes. It modulates mood, perception, memory, anger, aggression, reward, attention, appetite, sexuality, and probably others. Outside of behavioral effects, it plays a part in regulating other central nervous system processes like motor control, sleep, and circadian rhythms even body temperature. In the brain, serotonergic neurons are mostly found in clusters called the raphe nuclei, and they live in sort of the middle or midline of the midbrain, the pons and medulla, which are all parts of the brainstem just above the spinal cord. The clusters of serotonergic neurons closest to the bottom of the brainstem project to the spinal cord. The others project to the rest of the brain, like nearly everywhere. In particular, one part of the raphe cluster projects to the cerebral cortex where it's involved with cognition, mood, impulse control, as well as motor function. Another part of the raphe cluster projects to the basal ganglia, and ganglia is another word for group, so it projects to another group of brain structures in the center of the brain that are responsible for movement, learning, emotional processing, among other things. Another part of the raphe cluster projects to the dentate gyrus, which is part of the hippocampal structure and is involved in memory formation. There are other projections, but as I said, there's nary a part of the brain where serotonin isn't projecting. So hopefully that's enough to get a picture of this incredibly diffuse and busy neurotransmitter. I mentioned a few minutes ago that serotonin is removed from the synaptic cleft by reuptake transporters and a class of antidepressant drugs called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, block the reuptake transporter to keep serotonin active in the SNAPs for longer than normal. Of other interest in health and wellness spheres, the stimulant drug ecstasy, also called methylene dioxymethamphetamine, or MDMA, massively manipulates serotonin transmission, among other neurotransmitters, it seems to bind to serotonin transporters as well as other transporters belonging to norepinephrine, a neurotransmitter we'll get to in a minute. When MDMA binds to these transporters, it reverses the flow of these neurotransmitters and causes them to release back into the synaptic cleft. But here's the kicker. It also prevents their reuptake, which massively increases their levels and duration in the synaptic cleft. 
This would have a lot of effects, but it's possible the flood of serotonin contributes to the euphoric and hallucinogenic effect of MDMA. Before you get excited, this kind of massive neurotransmitter flooding also causes excitotoxicity, which I've already mentioned ravages your neurons and leads to cell death, and cell death leads to damaged brain structures, and damaged brain structures leads to overall nervous system malfunction. So it's not to be taken flippantly or without medical monitoring, preferably by a professional, not your Uncle Jim who used to make it in his basement and sold it as candy necklaces to kids at rapes. There are potential therapeutic uses of MDMA. At the time of writing this episode, there are drug trials currently underway to determine its efficacy in treating post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, with so far very promising outcomes. I've posted a phase three MDMA drug trial study in the references section of the show notes if you're interested in learning more about it. Now that you've learned a little bit about serotonin and reuptake transporters, you'll recognize what this paper is talking about. It's a pretty cool feeling when you can crack science speak codes in academic papers, so I hope you at least give it a try. Okay, so the next neurotransmitter is more than a neurotransmitter, but we're going to mostly talk about its neurotransmitterness, and that is dopamine. I don't know how to feel about dopamine. Is it friend? Is it foe? It's most definitely necessary. There's a number of dopaminergic pathways, each of which have very different functions involving multiple body systems. It's involved in craving and reward, motivation, learning and approach behavior, cognition, motor function, and prolactin regulation, which is involved in vastly different mechanisms from metabolism to sexual satisfaction to immune function. So all good things, right? But it's also connected to addictive behaviors. So the craving and pursuing of all those good things can become uncontrollable. So dopamine can be your best friend and also a bit of a sociopath or a micromanaging narcissistic boss who, if you enable, will lock you into cycles that siphon every ounce of autonomy and agency from your life. But if you just let it think it's the best of all the boss molecules running your body and occasionally affirm its business acumen, it won't bleed your soul dry and it may even let you keep a plant on your desk. Okay, that's a a bit abstract, but you'll get me if you listen to the many, many science educators and wellness influencers talk about it. I highly recommend the book Dopamine Nation by psychiatrist Dr. Anna Lemke. It's a really fascinating and intimate dive into the many facets of dopamine's effects on our behavior, but most notably addiction. What I'm qualified to tell you is that dopamine is both excitatory and inhibitory, and it is both a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator. It may also be a hormone. It also makes norepinephrine. I mean, it's a bit of an overachiever and possibly a control freak, but we put up with it because, let's be honest, chocolate, thinking, coordination, and orgasms are worth it. You're probably wondering how it can be both inhibitory and excitatory. It depends on the postsynaptic receptor channel. Dopamine has several subtypes of receptors, and some of them initiate an influx of sodium ions that make it excitatory, and some initiate an efflux of potassium ions that make it inhibitory. So what about these many dopaminergic pathways? There are four major pathways and many minor pathways. The majors are mesolimbic, mesocortical, nigrostriatal, and tuberoinfundibular pathways. We could talk about each of them for days. I mean, everything in this episode we could talk about for days. It feels like I've been talking for days. So thank you for sticking with me. Hang in there a little bit longer. We're gonna get into some of these major pathways. Okay, briefly. The mesolimbic pathway is the reward pathway and it begins with a group of dopaminergic neurons in the ventral tegmental area, also known as the VTA, which is kind of near the upper front of the midbrain, which is at the top of the brainstem. Those neurons project to many areas of the limbic system, which is deep inside your brain above your brainstem. Most notably are projections that reach the nucleus accumbens, amygdala, and hippocampus. The mesolimbic pathway is the pathway that motivates us to seek pleasurable things like food, sex, achieving a long sought after goal, 
anything that feels rewarding. It's also the pathway that if not kept in check, will kick you in the teeth. Not totally on its own, the mesocortical pathway lends a hand as well, but it's mostly this pathway. It's lovingly called the reward pathway, but it's also brutally known as the circuitry that with enough repetitive exposure to a reward, organic or artificial, can keep us compulsively craving and seeking more and more of that reward. For example, every like, share, and retweet you receive on your socials begets the craving and pursuing of more likes, shares, and retweets. And oh my goodness, when an internet celebrity influencer or whatever unexpectedly likes your comment on their account, or better, responds to your comment favorably, you feel amazing. And what happens is you form an amazing feeling association to that reward. And once that association has been formed, it can continue to have a strong influence on your drive to seek more of that reward for quite some time. This crave, seek, and act cycle can tether you to them without any assuredness of reciprocity. But it's that anticipation of reciprocity that they may like or comment or respond again That is what keeps you seeking more of that reward. And every time that reward is fulfilled, the drive gets stronger. The crave, seek, act cycle gets more and more repetitive, thus more and more addictive. And some of these influencers and most definitely these platforms bank on you being in repetitive, addictive, crave and pursue cycles because that keeps you on these platforms for longer durations. Now, I know all of you probably have a very manageable relationship with social media, but in the event that you ever find yourself feeling pressure to be in a constant contact with anyone on your socials, whether that's external or internal pressure, take a minute. If you're racing to comment on a post in hopes it will be seen and then keep checking to see how many likes your comment has, and if that influencer or any person of interest has acknowledged you, give it another minute. Give it many minutes. Give it all the minutes. Instead of posting or checking, put your device down and go outside if it's safe for you to do so. Take a tour around your block. Say hi to a neighbor or call a friend and tell them how wonderful they are. Exercise, meditate, read or listen to a book like Dr. Lemke's Dopamine Nation. Interrupt the cycle. You can actually kind of reset this pathway, at least in this context, It doesn't mean you never check or post again, but you get to control when and why rather than letting when and why drive and control you. Now, I've never met Dr. Lemke. I have no relationship with her. I'm not trying to sell you books. You can probably find Dopamine Nation at your local library. What you may find helpful from her book is a dopamine reset protocol. This is not a dopamine fast. This is not a 24-hour reset. This takes time. She makes suggestions backed by rigorous research on how to break free of crave, seek, and act cycles, including over-engagement with social media. So that may be of some help to you. It was enormous help to me. Okay, so that wasn't really at all brief, but that was the mesolimbic dopaminergic reward pathway. Next is the mesocortical dopaminergic pathway. This pathway also begins at the VTA. Again, that's the ventral tegmental area but it projects to the prefrontal cortex, which is the top few millimeters of the surface of your brain at the very front. This area is where something called executive functions live. And that refers to cognitive functions and cognitive control. But dopamine's role in these processes has an excitatory effect on planning, reason, problem solving, attentional control, and short-term memory. Dysregulation of this pathway is believed to contribute to ADHD, addiction, and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Okay, so that one was brief. Next up, the nigrostriatal dopaminergic pathway. This pathway begins with a group of dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is in the midbrain at the very top of your brainstem, and those project to basal ganglia, more particularly to the caudate nucleus and the putamen, which are part of the dorsal striatum. It's a lot of words you may not know right now, but we'll get to know them in a future episode. You'll recall a serotonin pathway also leads to basal ganglia, 
and that this group of brain structures is in the center of the brain and is responsible for movement, learning, emotional processing, and much more. Dopamine's effect on these structures is excitatory on GABAergic neurons, which then inhibit further striatal neural projections to influence voluntary movement. Why activate an inhibitory response to movement? Well, when this pathway is damaged, voluntary movement becomes uncontrollable or unstable. Symptoms of Parkinson's disease emerge when the nigrostriatal dopaminergic pathway is compromised from neurodegeneration in the substantia nigra. So in this pathway, dopamine is working in cahoots with GABA to help you maintain control over your voluntary movements. So you're not moving when you don't wish to. Okay, so the last dopaminergic pathway I'll talk about today is the tuberoinfundibular pathway. This begins with dopamine neurons in the hypothalamus, which kind of sits at the top and in front of the brainstem, and these dopamine neurons project to the pituitary gland, which kind of drops underneath the hypothalamus. And I say drops because there really isn't a better way to describe what the pituitary gland looks like other than your brain's tiny scrotum. This gland connects the nervous system to the endocrine system, and dopamine's effect on this gland is to regulate secretion of hormones, in particular, prolactin. Prolactin has a pretty vast CV. From maternal processes, to sex hormone regulation, to human social bonding, to glucose regulation and appetite and metabolism, it has its fingers in a lot of pies. Dopamine's effect on this pathway is actually inhibitory. It's part of a negative feedback loop, hello homeostasis, and a negative feedback loop that stops the secretion of prolactin. Again, we have good reason to wish to inhibit the release of something. Elevated levels of prolactin can cause prolactinemia, which has been correlated, and by correlated, it's not the same as causal, but correlated with obesity, insulin resistance, fatty liver disease, and infertility, to name a few reasons why it should be regulated. The regulation of prolactin release is important, and dopamine is the shutoff part of that regulation. So those are some of the dopamine pathways. Dopamine is removed from the synaptic cleft by way of reuptake transporter, and related to health and wellness spheres, these transporters are a target for both prescription and recreational drugs. Much like the way SSRIs block serotonin reuptake transporters, the stimulant drug cocaine blocks dopamine transporters, preventing reuptake and allowing it to accumulate and linger in the synaptic cleft for longer periods of time. Cocaine is highly addictive. Going back to the reward pathway, when the rewards of euphoria, energy, and alertness is associated with the drug, the drive to seek more cocaine to get that reward elevates. But diabolically, the more exposure to cocaine someone has, the more the brain desensitizes to natural reward stimuli and simultaneously hypersensitizes the neural circuitry responsible for the stress response So even the slightest bit of stress can drive cocaine users to seek out more cocaine. And it doesn't stop there. Repeated cocaine use increases one's tolerance to it. So you can see where this is going. More use at higher and higher doses. So you can get trapped in this cycle of rising cocaine use frequency and dose, which plummets coping capacity to the slightest stress, which leads to increased frequency and dose. And it gets worse. Repeated high doses of cocaine leads to developing sensitivity to its toxicity effects, which means the more someone uses repeatedly, the less is needed to launch them into anxiety, panic, convulsions, paranoia, potentially even psychosis. From there, we're looking at brain damage and loads of other organ damage, increased risk for stroke, brain bleed, cognitive deterioration, heart ruptures, movement disorders, It's really an unending list of all the ways cocaine can break down someone's body, yet keep them just alive enough to thoroughly experience their own deterioration. If I didn't articulate this well enough earlier, please don't mess with dopamine. Let it do what it's supposed to do, but do your best to not overindulge it. So the last neurotransmitter I'll mention today is norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline. It is both a neurotransmitter 
and a hormone. I've heard that it's called noradrenaline when we're referring to it as a hormone, but I've also read the opposite, so I'll just refer to it as norepinephrine. It is found in both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, it is a major player in the fight or flight response. For more on that, see episode two. As neurotransmitters in the central nervous system, norepinephrine has two pathways that project to nearly every region of the brain. One pathway begins with a group of neurons in the locus ceruleus, or locus ceruleus. Either way, it's a fabulous name for anything and sounds like a planetary system somewhere in the Star Wars universe. So the locus ceruleus is located in the dorsal pons, so the back of the middle of the brainstem. The other group is in the ventral pons and medulla. These neurons project to all over the forebrain, which is the whole top of your brain, including the cortex, thalamus, and limbic system. The limbic system includes the hypothalamus, hippocampus, and amygdala. They also project to other areas of the brainstem, plus cerebellum and spinal cord. So pretty much everywhere. (laughs) Norepinephrine has an excitatory effect on these areas, and its main gig is to increase attention, alertness, or vigilance to environmental events. It also plays a regulatory role in blood pressure and has roles in memory, mood, and sleep-wake cycles. Interestingly, norepinephrine is made from dopamine in the terminal button vesicles. It is removed from the synaptic cleft by reuptake transporter and is either degraded by enzymes or restored in vesicles. Of health and wellness interest, norepinephrine is a key player in sleep regulation in that it promotes waking and is highly active during wakefulness. If you're on social media, you probably can't scroll one minute without coming across posts telling you that low solar angle sun exposure in the morning and evening will help regulate your circadian rhythms. Well, norepinephrine may play a significant role in this dynamic. An older study by Gonzalez and Aston Jones found that timing of light exposure is a catalyst in norepinephrine's role in sleep-wake cycles, as it appears to contribute to the maintenance, integrity, and function of norepinephrine projections from the locus ceruleus. And robust locus ceruleus projections entrain circadian rhythms by increasing wakefulness and inhibiting sleep during active periods of the day. Other notable health and wellness considerations involve norepinephrine dysregulation. When norepinephrine transmission is compromised, the downstream effects are implicated in the development and progression of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ADHD, schizophrenia, and depression. So let's recap the different neurotransmitters, what they do, and how they're removed from the synaptic cleft. Again, the synaptic cleft is a significant target for both prescription and recreational drugs. So if you skip directly to this recap and wish to learn more about that, I do give a few examples of which drugs affect which neurotransmitter synapses in the previous many minutes. So you may wish to go back and listen to that. Okay, so recap. The two primary neurotransmitters responsible for excitation and inhibition are glutamate and GABA. Glutamate's main gig is to help move signals along from cell to cell until whatever action needs to happen, happens. It is also active in learning and memory processes, and it may also be involved in the sleep-wake cycle. Glutamate is usually removed from the synaptic cleft by way of reuptake transporters. GABA's main job is to stabilize brain activity and help attenuate overactivity that would otherwise lead to anxiety, agitation, sleep disturbances, and depression, among many other things. GABA is removed from the synaptic cleft by reuptake transporters. Acetylcholine is involved in REM sleep, perceptual learning, and contributes to the formation of memories. It's also involved in regulating blood pressure and heart rate and sexual desire and motivation and many other things. It's cleared from the synaptic cleft by enzyme degradation and reuptake. Serotonin modulates almost all human behavior and many neuropsychological processes, including cognition, mood, impulse control, learning, emotional processing, and memory formation. It also plays a part in regulating motor control, sleep, and circadian rhythms, even body temperature. Serotonin is removed from the synaptic cleft by reuptake transporters. Dopamine is implicated in a number of different functions, including craving, reward, motivation, learning and approach behavior, cognition, motor function, 
and prolactin regulation, which is involved in vastly different mechanisms from metabolism to social satisfaction to immune function. Dopamine is also a major player in addictive behavior. It is removed from the synaptic cleft by reuptake transporters. Now, norepinephrine's main roles include increasing attention, alertness, or vigilance to environmental events, memory, mood, and the sleep-wake cycle. It also plays a regulatory role in blood pressure. It is removed from the synaptic cleft by reuptake transporter and is either degraded by enzymes or restored in vesicles. Okay, moving on. I think at this juncture, it's important to gently remind everyone that none of these chemicals work independently of each other in a siloed manner. Serotonin isn't solely responsible for mood. Dopamine isn't solely responsible for motivation. Neurotransmitters work in conjunction with each other and with other body chemistry like hormones. I've tried to simplify neuronal physiology and the neurotransmission process to give you a picture of what the neuron does and why. But to be clear, intentionally increasing the levels of any one neurotransmitter won't necessarily increase the action you're hoping for. Or if it does, you may not be fully clear about the demands you're putting on other neural systems to compensate for that shift in homeostasis. And I hope I've also made it clear that messing with your brain chemistry without medical supervision could have pretty disastrous consequences. I also want to clarify the difference between a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator. I didn't really get into specifics of neuromodulation, partly because they don't behave the same way as neurotransmitters do, and though some neurotransmitters can also act as neuromodulators, not all neuromodulators are neurotransmitter chemicals. Some are also peptide hormones. In a nutshell, neuromodulators are released from a presynaptic button in a voluminous and diffuse manner to alter the synaptic strength of multiple neurons and control the amount of neurotransmitter released by these neurons. While neurotransmitters create a rapid effect on the postsynaptic neuron and their action terminates in the synapse immediately, neuromodulators take their time and can produce either a short-term or long-term excitatory or inhibitory effect. Ultimately, they add a level of flexibility and adaptability to neural circuitry. Some neuromodulators that are also neurotransmitters are acetylcholine, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, and some of the effects on the body behavior that I mentioned these chemicals produce may also be due to modulation rather than strictly transmission. Okay, we are nearing the end of this colossal episode but I didn't want to end without going over some of the different types of neurons that you may hear mentioned in health and wellness discussions. So structurally, neurons are classified as multipolar, like our example, and that is common in most vertebrae animals. Unipolar is most common in invertebrate organisms. Bipolar are found in most sensory tissue. And pseudopolar is a version of bipolar neurons that sense touch and pain. Functionally, neurons are classified as sensory neurons, which collect information from sensory organs like eyes, skin, ears, tongue, and send it to the central nervous system for processing. We have motor neurons, which carry signals from the brain and spinal cord to muscles to act in response to sensory information. And we have interneurons, which connect some neurons to other neurons. These are very broad classifications, and just about every neuron falls into one of them. But as I said at the very beginning of this opus, is that neurons are fantastical cells. Golgi and Ramon Hikahal gave us a glimpse into their unique and wildly intricate morphology. It seems almost a shame to reduce them to such broad categories. Thankfully, there are more particular names given to neurons based on their structure, and some of those are the following. Purkinje and pyramidal cells, which have a soma-shaped somewhat conical or pyramid-like. There are basket cells, which have loads of axonal branches that surround the postsynaptic soma. There are stellate cells, which are my personal favorite. Their dendrites branch out into star-like formations, a little bit like the jazz hands of neurons. There are lots of others. If you want to explore the many different kinds of neurons, there is a fantastic website with a searchable gallery of digital renderings of so many different neurons. I'll post a link in the show notes. The website is called neuromorpho.org, and you can browse by cell type. 
At the time of writing this episode, they have 242,462 digital images of neurons cataloged. Now, there is one type of neuron I have not yet mentioned, and those are mirror neurons. It's a bit of a stingy subject, mainly because interpretations of how they function in humans have been somewhat divided. What I can tell you is that in humans, they appear to be found in the prefrontal cortex, the premotor area, and possibly a few other neighboring areas. In terms of physiological function, mirror neurons activate in equal measure whether we witness someone perform an action or we ourselves perform the same action. For example, I see you pick up a mug, my mirror neurons fire as though I picked up the mug even though I did not perform that action. I believe it's even possible that if we were in total darkness and I heard you pick up the mug, my mirror neurons would fire as though I picked up the mug. They are incredibly fascinating. Where it gets muddy and somewhat controversial is to what extent mirror neurons are involved in higher cognitive processes in humans. Some have interpreted that motor action mirroring could be a telepathic-like understanding of someone else's actions. This led to the hypothesis that mirror neurons enable us to predict and understand another's mental state. Mirror neurons were lauded as cells that read minds and may even contribute to empathy. A number of branches of social sciences have leapt at this hypothesis and even developed psychotherapeutic modalities based on it. There is still much debate as to whether there is enough evidence to support whether or not mirror neurons actually make it possible for humans to infer the intentions or mental states underlying another's actions. One very clinging argument is that most humans aren't clear of their own intentions or mental states underlying their behavior or actions. So how could someone observing our behavior understand what isn't clear in our own minds? There are many other arguments from both sides of the divide, but it seems the neuroscience community are mostly in agreement that, based on current empirical evidence, human mirror neurons are involved in lower-level visual processing of motor actions, but there's not yet enough evidence to support that they are involved in higher-level cognitive processing that leads to inferring the mental states underlying the action. But I'll leave you with an interesting and recent study looking at possible mirror neurons and mouse aggression. The gist is that certain neurons in the mouse hypothalamus activate both when mice are fighting as well as when they're just watching other mice fighting. Further to this, their activation may trigger aggressive action and even encode who wins the fight. But again, these neurons were in the hypothalamus, not the prefrontal cortex. They were also in mice and not in humans. And the authors acknowledged that these neurons could be part of a larger system of neurons in the hypothalamus, which is a great reminder that in humans, any one behavior or action is not the result of one group of neurons acting in a siloed manner. I have no strong opinions about mirror neurons, and I'd like to try to keep a curious and open mind toward anything we don't yet fully understand. But if you have strong opinions about mirror neurons, please don't slash my tires, but do let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Remember to be kind. People who have been studying mirror neurons for 30 years still don't have all the answers. Okay, so that's it for this week. I'm starting to lose my voice, but thank you so much for hanging in there. This was a lot of information and I hope at least some of it was helpful. Your homework for this week, should you wish to further your understanding of the magnificent neuron, is to explore the work of neuroscientists, neurobiologists, neurophysiologists, and the like, who study the many functions, pathways, networks, morphology, and physiology of neurons. Here are a few to get you started. First up is Dr. Danny Bissett. I'm not sure where to even begin with introducing Dr. Bissett to you because their research interests are so expansive and diverse, yet deeply and intrinsically tied to one another. I should mention first that they are a professor of bioengineering, electrical and systems engineering, physics and astronomy, neurology, and psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. That should give you some clue as to the range of Dr. Bissett's academic interests and pursuits. 
Among the multitude of awards they have received, they were the youngest person to be awarded the prestigious MacArthur Fellow Genius Grant. What Dr. Bissett is probably most well known for is their ability to connect systems engineering with neuroscience to identify underlying mechanisms of cognition and disease in human brain networks. I am in absolute awe of the range and genius of Dr. Bissett's work. I'll post a study from their lab in the show notes. It involves white matter development in adolescence. White matter refers to myelinated axons, which relates very much to this episode. It's one of at least 300 published academic papers Dr. Bissett has co-authored. Also of note, Dr. Bissett co-authored a book with their twin brother, Perry Zern, called Curious Minds, The Power of Connection. I haven't read it yet, but it's on its way to me, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Next is Dr. Yasmin Hurd. Dr. Hurd is the director of the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai, the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience, and Professor of Psychiatry, Neuroscience, and Pharmacological Sciences at the Icahn School of Medicine. Dr. Hurd's lab studies addiction through genetics, cell and molecular biology, and psychology, among many other lenses. Her research repertoire is vast and includes risk factors of addiction and the effects of drugs of abuse on neural substrates. In particular, Dr. Hurd has made incredible contributions to furthering our understanding of cannabis on the adolescent and young adult developing brain. I've posted a paper from her lab in the show notes. It's a systematic review, which is the consolidation of many related studies, and it's titled Neural Underpinnings of Social Stress in Substance Use Disorders. You'll recognize many of the biological and physiological concepts in this paper if you've been following this series from the beginning, including a thorough explanation of the negative feedback loop in the stress response, the impact of chronic stress on dendrites, the impact of stress and drugs of abuse on the dopaminergic reward pathway, and so much more. It beautifully articulates and expands on many of the things you've been learning from this series and loads of brain areas and nervous system functions we haven't even discussed yet. But I highly recommend giving it a read and maybe even keep going back to it as we get further along in this series and see how much more you understand as we go, if this is unfamiliar territory for you. Next is Dr. Diana Bautista. Dr. Batista is a Howard Hughes investigator and a professor of cell biology, development, and physiology at the University of California, Berkeley, neurobiology department. One of Dr. Batista's research interests is the somatosensory cortex and its role in acute and chronic pain. The paper I posted in the show notes from Dr. Batista's lab is titled The Cellular and Molecular Mechanisms of Pain. Among the many biological and physiological aspects of pain, This paper discusses unmyelinated neurons called C-fibers and their involvement in slow pain and touch, which we briefly looked at in this episode. Lastly, we have Dr. Kafui Jurasa, who is a multi-award winning professor of psychiatry, behavioral sciences, neurobiology, bioengineering, and neurosurgery at Duke University. Dr. Jurasa's diverse research interests range from what electrical patterns in the brain can tell us about coping mechanisms to how machine learning can predict mental illness, and to how genes associated with neuropsychiatric risk interact with environmental stress and alter neural circuitry that underlies healthy, emotional, and cognitive function. I've posted an older study he authored in the show notes, and it's about dopaminergic control of sleep-wake states and its relation to psychosis in Parkinson's disease. It's brimming with terminology from today's episode. Again, also, if you scroll to the end of the show notes or possibly pinned in the comments, you'll find a list of papers and books I sourced to write this episode, so you may find something of interest there as well. Finally, I will leave you with this fabulous quote from Santiago Romoni Cajal, where he states that neurons are mysterious butterflies of the soul, the beating of whose wings might one day, who knows, reveal the secrets of mental life. Oh, okay, lovelies, thank you for being here. Again, please check out the STEM organizations in the show notes and support them or others in any way that you are able. I have no relationship with these organizations. I'm just a fan of the work they're doing, and I hope that you will be too. If you like this episode, please click like and subscribe and the notification bell if you haven't already. Please share it with your friends, neighbors, and family, and anyone you think would benefit from understanding their body a little better. <laughs>
You've been a dream for staying the whole way to the end. Until next time, take care out there.